In December 1980, there was a series of reported sightings of unexplored lights near Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk, England. Sometimes called Britain's Roswell, this sighting is the most famous UFO sighting in the United Kingdom. Rendlesham Forest consists of about 15 square kilometers of woodland located in the county of Suffolk, about 13 kilometers east of the town of Ipswich. Today it's owned by Forestry England and is open to the public with recreation facilities for walkers, cyclists and campers. While the forest is remote, it's nothing really remarkable beyond the beautiful scenery. However, close to the forest is the Royal Air Force Woodbridge, which is a former Royal Air Force station located east of Woodbridge in the county of Suffolk, England. It was constructed in 1943 as an RAF military airfield during the Second World War with the purpose of assisting damaged aircraft that were returning from raids over Germany. During the Cold War, the station would be used by the United States Air Force. The Air Ministry made the base available to the US in early 1952, and the work to bring it up to NATO standards quickly began. The station would eventually become the home for the 79th and 78th Tactical Fighter Squadrons, as well as squadrons of the 81st Fighter Wing. The 81st would also operate from the nearby station, which is called RAF Bentwaters. This led to Bentwaters and Woodbridge to become known as the Twin Bases. These two bases would be in use until 1993 and have since been closed. As well as the incident in the forest, the bases themselves have been subject to some theories regarding the true purpose of the base. Some people believe that the basis was used for the storing of nuclear missiles by the US without the populace of the United Kingdom knowing. But the thing that the area is most famous for is the events of December 1980. On the early morning of the 26th of December 1980, light was reportedly seen by a security patrol near the east gate of RAF Woodbridge. The lights were apparently seen descending into the nearby Rendlesham Forest. Given the proximity of these lights to the base, the patrol, consisting of Jim Penniston, John Burroughs and Ed Kabansag, initially thought that this was an aircraft that had either crashed or had been forced down. After radioing in and getting permission to investigate by the on-duty flight chief, they headed in the direction of the lights. Upon entering the forest to investigate, they quickly spotted a glowing object. Reportedly, this object was metallic and triangular in shape. It appeared to be around 2 to 3 meters across the base and 2 meters high. The object was very bright, illuminating the entire forest in a white light and it had pulsing red lights at the top and blue lights underneath. Penniston and Burroughs were the ones heading into the forest to investigate this craft, while Kabansag stayed near the truck as a radio relay. But despite him being near the truck, he could still see the pulsing lights of whatever this thing in the forest was. Reportedly, Penniston and Burroughs would feel these strange sensations in their hair, their skin and their clothing, as if there was electricity in the air. Penniston would later claim that he saw a craft of unknown origin while in the woods that night. He even says that he examined this craft for about 45 minutes. He even supposedly touched this craft, which felt smooth. He even touched these hieroglyphic inscriptions that were engraved on the side of the craft, which felt more like sandpaper. 
He would even make sketches of these inscriptions. Whatever this light or craft was, it suddenly moved, which drove the animals on a nearby farm into a frenzy. Because of all the noise by the animals both in the woods and on the farm, as well as the lights being seen, someone had called police, and they arrived at the scene at around 4 a.m. However, by the time they arrived, the only lights they reported seeing came from the nearby lighthouse. Once the sun was up on the morning of the 26th of December, servicemen would head out into the forest to see if anything was amiss. They did find a small clearing near the eastern edge of the forest, where they also saw three small impressions on the ground in a triangular pattern. They would also find burn marks and broken branches on nearby trees. Police would be called to the area once again on this day at around 10.30 a.m. They would be shown these impressions on the ground, but they dismissed it, saying that it was most likely made by an animal. The deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, decided to investigate these strange occurrences, and he headed to the site with several servicemen in the early hours of the 28th of December, 1980, though he would later report this date as the 29th of December. Halt and his team ventured into the forest equipped with cameras and Geiger counters. Using a standard US military radiation survey meter, they took radiation readings in the triangle of depressions that were found. And they did record some readings, with the peak readings were found in the three depressions and also near the center of the triangle that were formed by these depressions. During this investigation, the group would also spot a flashing light across the field to the east. Almost in line with a farmhouse, the same farmhouse where the animals had gotten into a frenzy the night before. In the same line of sight, they would also spot the lighthouse that was further to the east. They also saw three star-like lights in the sky two to the north and one to the south, slightly above the horizon. The brightest of these lights would hover for about two to three hours, and even seemed to beam down a stream of light from time to time. The halt tape is the tape that Colonel Halt made on the night of the second sighting on the early hours of December 28, 1980. And this tape chronicles the investigation in the forest in real time. This includes them taking the radiation readings and seeing the flashing lights between the trees. Two weeks later, Halt would write a memo that he sent to the Ministry of Defense. The memo does have some errors in the dates and times given. For instance, the first sighting was supposedly on the 26th of December, but the memo reports it as the 27th. However, this might be explained by the fact that he didn't write this memo until two weeks later, so he might have gotten some of the dates confused. However, apart from some rumors and some witnesses wondering what the hell they had seen, no one in the general public knew anything about these events that took place in December 1980. Halt's memo would not be released into the public domain by the US government until three years later when it was released under the US Freedom of Information Act. Almost as soon as this was released, there were headlines across the world and the story became a sensation, the subject of much speculation, disinformation and even a lot of conspiracy theories. The biggest one being that this was something alien in origin that the governments of both the UK and the US covered up, which Halt himself seems to believe as he has gone on record saying that he believes that he witnessed an extraterrestrial event that was then covered up. Let's get back to the group of men that saw this craft in the woods. What is probably one of the most famous details of this case is the notebook of binary code that Jim Penniston wrote. 
As I mentioned previously, the craft he saw was reportedly non-aerodynamic, triangular, black and glassy with patterns of blue, yellow and red colors running through the surface as though part of the craft. He has said that he got so close to this craft that he could touch it and when he did touch it, he could not see or hear anything except for a brilliant bright white light. He has no idea how much time passed from the moment he touched the craft and was engulfed in this bright white light to the moment where he found himself standing next to the craft. Could be minutes, could be seconds, he has no idea. However, by the time he came to, the craft itself started to turn a bright white color. So intense that Peniston began to worry that the craft was going to explode, so he quickly moved away. Once he had gotten to a safe distance from the craft, it quickly ascended and took off in the blink of an eye. But the experience that Peniston had would not stop there. The next day, he kept seeing ones and zeros in his mind's eye. Over and over and over again. To the point where he started obsessively writing them down in a notebook, filling up 16 pages. This actually caused the images in his mind to disappear. Peniston was not familiar with binary code or anything like that in 1980, so he believed that these were just nothing but gibberish. So he put the notebook away and didn't think much of it. In fact, it wasn't until 2010 that he brought up this notebook during a conversation he had with a researcher. The researcher quickly realized that this might be binary code, so he offered to help decipher whatever was written in this book. This eventually led to binary code expert and researcher Joe Luciano taking a look at the code. After obtaining all 16 pages, he set about figuring out what this code was. A consultant to the National Archives named David Clark investigated the background of this memo and the reaction that the Ministry of Defense had to this memo. He did interviews with many of the personnel involved with this case, and through those interviews he was able to confirm the cursory nature of the investigation that the Ministry of Defense had conducted. The more interesting part is that Clark failed to find any evidence of any other official report of this incident beyond the simple investigation done by the Ministry of Defense and, of course, Halt's writings about it. The Ministry of Defense's file on the case would be released in 2001. It mostly consisted of internal correspondence and also responses to inquiries that the public had made. There was definitely a lack of an in-depth investigation, which does give the impression that they did not take this case seriously at all. This would of course be criticized, and British government defense minister Lord David Trefgarn noted that in his memo to the Ministry of Defense, Colonel Halt did not recommend further investigation. Which technically is true, as the memo only describes the events that occurred. Trefgarn also says that the fact that Halt did not write his memo until two weeks later gave the impression of this case not being of any great importance. So they did a very basic investigation and left it at that. Supposedly, one of the officers even returned to the scene in daylight in case he had missed something, but once again he reported that nothing unusual was found. In 1997, Scottish researcher James Easton would obtain the original witness statements made by those involved in the sightings that first night. Ed Kebensag, who was there that night, would say in his statement that the lights appeared to be coming from past the forest. And once they got to a vantage point, they were able to determine that the light was only a beacon light off in the distance. In this original witness statement, John Burroughs, who was also present that night, would state that they had followed this light for about two miles before they were able to determine that it was coming from a lighthouse. He also reported hearing sounds almost like a woman screaming, and farm animals were making a lot of noises. Colonel Halt would report these same noises two nights later. 
and some have speculated that this noise is made by deer in the forest. But it should be noted, however, that Burroughs have said in later interviews that he did see an object in the forest, which does contradict this original witness statement a bit. Another statement regarding this incident in the forest came from a forestry worker named Vince Turkettle, who supposedly had been chopping wood in Rendlesham Forest when a car suddenly drew up and two men dressed in black suits stepped out. They approached Turnkettle and proceeded to ask him a lot of questions about strange lights being seen in the forest the night before. Turkettle was confused by these questions, but he assumed that these men were journalists. So he answered their questions as best he could, which really wasn't much because he hadn't seen anything odd. The men would thank him for his time and then quickly left. After not seeing anything about this case in the newspapers, but there were some rumors about the strange lights and a possible UFO sighting, Turkettle would then ask his boss to show him the scene where this took place. According to Turkettle, there was nothing unusual about this scene. To him, it just looked like a normal glade in the forest, with three carefully marked rabbit scrapes in a rough triangle shape. Turkettle will also claim that the broken trees in the forest are nothing unusual either. The burr marks, they were just left by one of the other rangers, a man called Bill Briggs, who had been using an axe. While Turkettle did not think much of the men in suits, others have. That's not the first time these guys have been connected to the Rendlesham Forest. For instance, a UFO investigator named Brenda Butler has been researching this case for many years and reportedly would visit the forest every week hoping to gather some evidence. In 1984, she, alongside two co-authors, wrote a book called Sky Crash, which questions why the UK authorities tried to conceal what happened in this forest. Speaking at a UFO conference in 2015, Butler would tell the audience that she and her two co-authors have been hounded by Ministry of Defense officials as well as the police. In fact, on one occasion, the Ministry of Defense allegedly tried to make her and one of her fellow investigators sign a contract to silence them over their findings. She spoke about how she had been getting calls from the police, how she has been followed, and how she has received threats. How there's been strange people coming to her home and standing in her drive. She even told the story of how she had been driving after visiting the forest when an army jeep started following the car up the road, which led to her and her companion panicking and then speeding up to try to get away. She also told the story of how, during one of her visits to the forest, there was a police car as well as a police helicopter observing her the entire time. And as she left the forest, she was told to not come back. Another supposed encounter with the so-called Men in Black came from a man named Larry Warren. Warren had also been sent out into the forest to investigate some strange lights that had been seen in the forest. On the third night when he was sent out, Warren would reportedly see his superior officers, Colonel Halt, as well as uh, Colonel Williams, standing near a strange bright craft. On the 29th of December 1980, Warren received a telephone call. The caller did not introduce themselves. Instead, they ordered him to be in the parking lot in 20 minutes or else. Seeing no other option, Warren quickly headed to the parking lot. He would then be approached by two men wearing dark suits, who motioned for him to get into a dark blue sedan. He would then be put in a case of semi-consciousness and was taken to some kind of underground facility, which he assumed was beneath the base, but he can't be sure. According to Warren, his next memory is him wandering around the base in a daze. And when he checked the time, he was shocked to discover that two days had passed since he had been picked up by the men in dark suits. 
Warren would then go on to write a book titled Left at East Gate, which details his experiences that night in 1980. As always, in many cases of strange phenomena, there are those who believe and those who don't. And with a case as famous as the Rendlesham Forest incident, there's a lot of people who have opinions. To keep things somewhat fair, I should highlight both sides of this story. The first proposed theory for this incident is a very simple one. It was a hoax. The BBC would report in 2003 that a former US security policeman named Kevin Condy would claim that he was responsible for this incident. He claimed that he had shone patrol car lights through the trees and he had made noises on the loudspeaker as a prank. He would also claim that these types of practical jokes were a tradition in security police. So he had decided to drive through the forest flashing the lights through the fog that was there as a prank. However, while it's very possible that Condi might have done this whole thing as a prank, we have no way of knowing that he did this prank on the nights in question beyond his claiming that he did. For all we know, he did this prank some other time. Another proposed theory is that this whole thing was caused by a downed Soviet spy satellite. However, there is no evidence to support this theory either. The most widely accepted explanation is that three factors were to blame for what happened. Reportedly, there had been a bright fireball over southern England the night that the airmen saw something that was descending into the forest. The marks that was found in the ground was left by animals, specifically rabbits, who had been digging in the area. And of course, the flashing lights were from the lighthouse. It's also been speculated that the star-like objects that Halt reported, that were hovering low to the north and south, were misinterpretations of bright stars distorted by atmospheric and optical effects. Despite the official explanation or skeptics giving their own theories, the Rendlesham Forest incident remains one of the most famous and well-documented UFO sightings in history. Despite the skepticism, there are many people who do believe that something strange did happen. Though they also believe that we may never really know the true nature of what this object was. Official investigations by both the British and the US governments not really providing any conclusive evidence of extraterrestrial activity, or lack thereof, has led to a lot of speculations of a cover-up. Rendlesham Forest is an interesting case to look into because there is so much information about this case, with lots of people voicing their opinions or even speaking of their own experiences or just dismissing the whole thing and saying this is fake and this is why. I've shared some tales by others, but I've tried to keep the focus on two of the main men in the story, which is Colonel Halt and Jim Peniston. Because whether or not you believe this story, both of these men have maintained that something strange did happen in that forest. And this is despite both of them facing a lot of ridicule over the years. As I mentioned before, it's probably unlikely that we will get the answers we want, or need in this case. In fact, many people who are involved with this case in one way or another seem to have come to terms with the fact that it's very possible that the Rendlesham Forest incident will always remain a mystery. But of course, having it be a mystery only means that the incident known as Britain's Roswell remains a topic of debate and fascination among UFO enthusiasts and researchers. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video, and thank you for being patient while I recovered from being sick. It attached itself to my vocal cords and I've been coughing like crazy, so much so that my chest actually hurts every time I take a breath. But my voice is now better, it's beginning to sound more like normal. I guess this will shock some of you, but no, this is not an AI voice, this is literally my voice. 
But anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. This is a big story. This case is more than 40 years old. There's been countless of movies, documentaries, TV shows, books, articles, interviews, countless stuff. I've tried to keep it as condensed as I possibly could. You know, the accounts by Halt and Penniston, alongside some of the interviews. They will be linked and I do recommend checking them out because it is very interesting. But I'm sure there's a lot of stuff about this case, a lot of statements about this case that was not mentioned in this video. And feel free to leave those in the comments if you feel like, hey, you missed this. That's it for me this time. I'm gonna go try and rest my voice because this actually is starting to get painful. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next one.